Hello everyone. So this is the first video um, of a series that will hopefully allow you to have a visual and auditory way of understanding the course pack material for the gross anatomy and embryology course. Now these videos are being put together by the Scrubs team, which is the Student Collaborative Resources for Understanding and Birdie Success. If you find over the course of um, this block that these videos are beneficial and our other resources have helped you, we um, do highly encourage you to join this group moving forward. And as this is the first video in the series, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about what this means. And in future series, you'll see this logo pop up again and again. So first thing I want to point out is our mission statement for Scrubs, and Scrubs is a student-driven initiative that aims to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Brody. Um, members of Scrubs participate in a variety of subcommittees working to create resources for students by students. One of these subcommittees is this um, visual aid that you are seeing today. These resources aim to offer unique perspective from students that have walked in the same shoes developing resources that we wish we had been exposed to during our time in the course. The hope is this organization will become a staple of the Birdie student body, um, exemplifying the unique collaborative community that Birdie offers. If this is a mission that aligns with your goals and you have a desire to help those that will come behind you, as well as a goal to leave your mark on Birdie as a whole, we highly encourage you to join this team at the conclusion of your Now, a disclaimer that you will see with all of our resources, it needs to be noted that these resources are made by students and as such, there is the possibility for errors in our development. That said, all of our resources go through multiple stages of vetting um, with multiple students looking over every resource. If there is a contradiction with the coursework presented, please go by the course documents. Again, please go by the course documents as your final say. These resources are meant to be supplemental and are not meant to replace the instruction given by the Brady faculty. Now, I also want to point out for these uh, videos and these video series, we are going to be attempting to go in the exact same order as your course pack, hitting the same content. That said, um, there is no way that we would go be able to hit every single topic that is within your course pack. So make sure you still are reading the course pack. These, once again, are just to give you an understanding, a visual of how to go through this material in case you're having difficulty getting through the course pack. I also recommend uh, that these videos should take less than 15 minutes uh, per video. Um, and if you find that you are capable, putting these on two times speed to just get a quick overview would be an excellent way to kind of preview this material for lab and for class. All right. All right. So we're going to start off with the first course back chapter, which is introductory um, anatomical terminology. And we're going to start off with the anatomical position. Now, when you're thinking about the anatomic position, it's really important that throughout the course, anytime that you read something in the course pack, the course pack is describing a body in anatomical position. So all the relationships that you will read here in the future are going to be referring to the body in anatomical position, meaning that you have to know what anatomical position is in order for any of this to make sense. So what is anatomical position? Well, anatomical position is a description of the human body that is standing erect, so standing up, eyes are looking forward and toward the horizon, meaning that they are uh, looking straight ahead. The upper limbs are by the sides, and you're going to see that the palms are turned anteriorly, or they're facing the front of the body. So palms are facing forward, the back of the hands are facing backwards, the feet are flat on the ground, arms are out towards the sides. Right, again, this is going to be a position that you're going to see over and over and over again. So it's really important to understand what this position is as you'll be seeing it again and again in the future. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some anatomical relationships. Now, again, when we're talking about relationships, these are relationships require two structures to be compared. So just saying anterior will not give you much of a description unless you say it is anterior to some other structure. And with that in mind, we're going to dive in to these specific relationships. So let's start with anterior versus posterior. The anterior position is anything towards the front of the body, while posterior is anything towards the back of the body. Again, important when you're reading in text, the anatomical relationships are implying that the body is in anatomical position. Right, an anatomical position is what we can see pictured here in this image. 
superior versus inferior, this one's relatively straightforward. Superior is going to be closer to the head, whereas inferior is closer to the feet. Okay. Now, again, anatomical position is really important to keep in mind when you're discussing this um, superior versus inferior position. Medial versus lateral, we're looking at the midline. So take the body and cut it in half right down the middle. And you're thinking anything lateral to that is going to be um, more lateral. Anything closer to midline is going to be more medial. So to kind of exemplify this, let's look at the hand. So if we were using that terminology from the midline, which direction are you in? The pinky would be more medial than the thumb, which would be more lateral. And the reason for that is the pinky is closer to the midline, which is the cut right down the middle, as opposed to the thumb, which is further away. So we're going to call that lateral. Now, palmar, plantar, and dorsal. These, this terminology isn't used as commonly as the rest, um, and it only comes up in a couple of cases, but we're going to go through what this terminology means here. So palmar. Palmer is going to refer to the palmar surface of the hand. So this is your palm. This is what you're grasping things with. Um, and the palmar surface in anatomical position is oriented in the anterior direction. Okay, so it's facing anteriorly. The plantar surface is the equivalent of the palmar surface on the foot. So it's that bottom of your foot. And in anatomical position, the plantar surface is oriented inferiorly towards the bottom. Dorsal. Dorsal comes up in a couple of different instances, but we're going to talk about it specifically here in relation to the hands and the feet. So the dorsal surface of the hands is the back of the hands, which aren't quite pictured here, and the back of the foot. So that gives you palmar, plantar, and then dorsal surfaces. Now, some relationships are a little bit more difficult to um, conceptualize. We're going to start with proximal versus distal. When we're talking about proximal versus distal, we're talking about um, how close are you to the trunk or the origin of the structure? So let's take the shoulder, which is the first portion of your upper extremity. The shoulder is proximal, closer to the trunk, than is your elbow. And your elbow is more proximal than your hand. That means that your hand is more distal than your elbow, and your hand is more distal than your shoulder. Notice that as I'm giving you these relationships, I am having to identify two separate structures. I am not just saying that the hand is distal, I'm saying the hand is distal to the shoulder. For instance, saying the hand is distal while true in relation to the shoulder may not be true if I'm talking about the fingernail. If I'm looking at a fingernail, the fingernail is more distal than the hand. So it's just important to make sure that you're giving um, both locations or your comparison if you're going to be using these anatomical relationships. Superficial versus deep. Um, this is, I like to think about, um, I'm taking a needle and I'm poking it into the skin. Superficial is going to be the first thing you hit, and deep, the further you go in, what structures do I hit as the needle's passing through the body? Internal versus external. This was not used quite as commonly as superficial and deep. Um, internal is usually denoting the inside of a body cavity or a hollow organ. So if I'm thinking about the bladder, there is an internal surface of the bladder, which is the um, most deep portion of that organ. And then external is usually the outside of a body cavity or hollow organ. So like the external surface of the bladder. And that's something that you will see much later in lab. Okay, now we're going to go into your anatomical planes. Now, I do want to point out that these anatomical planes and these relationships are going to show up again and again throughout this course, especially when it comes to imaging. You're going to get CT images and other radiological images that are going to have the body cut up into planes, and it's going to be very important to know what an instructor means when they're talking about the median plane, sagittal plane, frontal plane, or coronal plane, and uh, so forth. So let's start with the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane, is, imagine I am taking a sword and I raise it up over top of my head and I bring it straight down and you're standing right in front of me and I split you all the way in half. That is going to be a sagittal cut or that it will be a sagittal plane. Now, the sagittal plane does not have to be right down the middle. That would be the mid-sagittal plane, but it could be any kind of cut that is from top to bottom as I move throughout the body but it is always going to be a top to bottom cut. A coronal plane, on the other instance, 
is not quite that top to bottom cut as if I'm facing you. But imagine once again, I raise my sword up above my head and you are now standing to my side. So you're 90 degree angles. And then I go from top to bottom. That is going to give me a coronal plane. So in one coronal plane at the very front, I might have just the tip of my nose. But if I go further back, I'm going to go from the top of the head all the way down to the sides of the feet. Right. And so the important thing to know from sagittal and coronal, they're both coming from top to bottom. But the sagittal plane is as if I'm facing you and cutting you down the middle, whereas the coronal plane is as if I'm cutting you from a 90 degree angle from top to bottom. The transverse plane, this one's one of my favorites. This is, is imagine, this is how most of your CT images are going to be shown, so the one that you need to be most familiar with. A transverse plane is going to be a plane that cuts you straight across the middle of the body. Now, again, all of these planes don't have to be right in the middle, but they can go up, they can go down, but the plane is what we're referring to here. So the transverse plane is a cut from the sides. Now you can have a transverse plane of just the head region. We can have a transverse plane across the pecs, or we can have a transverse plane across the knees, but these are all in the transverse plane. And finally, oblique. Oblique is a term that refers to a plane that is in any angle, so that is not referred to by the plane, so that could be coming across the body at some diagonal angle. Okay, now let's talk about the movement around the joints. Now, the movement around the joints is something that you'll get much better at as the course goes on, but it's important to go ahead and introduce you to these terms now as they're going to be showing up throughout the course. First, let's talk about flexion. Flexion is whenever you are um, bending or decreasing the angle between body parts. So the way that I really like to think about flexion is I think about the motion around the um, elbow. So if I flex my elbow, right, I'm going to be constricting my bicep and I'm flexing, decreasing this angle of the joint. Extension would be the opposite. If you work out in the gym, think tricep pull downs. You're extending your arm and extending that joint. By using your triceps all right so that is going to be flexion decreasing an angle extension is increasing an angle and that's going to be for all joints that have that motion so in the knee i can have flexion which you see i'm bringing my heel towards my glute that's decreasing the angle of the joint or extension which would be increasing the angle of the joint same can be said for the spine extension increasing the angle of the joint flexion decreasing the angle of the joint Okay, next we have, I want to mention the flexor compartment and extensor compartment real quick. So if we look at this image here, the, and we look at our arms in the upper body, flexion is moving anteriorly, right? So that means that the flexor compartment is oriented in the anterior region of the body. The extensor compartment going posteriorly is posterior in the upper limb. Now in the lower limb, the flexor compartment is oriented posteriorly. So I bring my leg back to flex around my knee joint, whereas the extensor compartment is anterior. And one of the ways that you can think about this, go through the motion of flexion and extension at these joints and you can feel which muscles are contracting. So if I'm trying to extend my knee, you're going to see that your quads are going to contract right here in the front of your leg. And that will tell you that the anterior region in the lower limb is going to be your extensor compartment. Now, supination and pronation, these, are, these terms are specific to the hands. Um, so supination and pronation, the way that uh, we commonly think about it is think supination like I'm holding a bowl of soup. What this means is that your palmar surface, you know, where you grasp things and hold objects, that is going to be oriented superiorly. Whereas pronation is going to be putting your hand down like I'm dribbling a basketball. So supination, like I'm holding a bowl of soup. Pronation, putting my hand down. My palmar surface is facing inferiorly. Okay. Now there are some uh, more specific terms for flexion around the feet. So dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, inversion. But we'll save that until we get into that region of the course. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a few additional movements. If I combine, oh wait, first let's start about abduction and adduction. You're going to get these terms a lot. And it's important to know that is it AB 
duction with a B or a deduction with a D. If you're adducting, you're adding things towards your body. So the motion is towards the midline. Adduction, once again, is motion towards the midline. Abduction, motion away from the midline. So moving away from the midline is going to be abduction. Now, circumduction, as we can see here happening at the hip, this is a combination involving flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction in some kind of sequence. It produces a circular motion. So we can do this at both the hip joint and the shoulder joint. Now, some terms that are specific for the scapula are going to be elevation, depression, protraction, and retraction. These are probably what gives uh, students the most trouble. So what I would recommend here is looking up an image um, of the scapular motions. These do a decent job, but there are other images that may, you may find more beneficial. So elevation, going up, moving superiorly. Depression, moving inferiorly. And it's the scapula that's moving here. Protraction, something moving forward into the anterior plane. Retraction, something moving posterior, moving further towards the back. So you can also think of um, protrusion or protraction, retraction, just specifically for the scapula. And then elevation and depression could be for other structures, but again, moving superiorly and then uh, inferiorly with depression.